Hey everybody, Greenlight Productions here. I apologize for the loud noise of the fans in this silly mask. But we're in a highly regulated indoor facility, so that's just how it is. Now recently, Kiss Organics and Trust Science both put out a video sharing their opinion on the use of cover crops, companion plants, and living mulch indoors. Now these are two credible individuals who brought up valid points that shouldn't be ignored if in fact you want to use these systems successfully indoors. In fact, the only thing I disagree with that they said was just their opinion overall. And the only reason I'm sharing my opinion with you is because both of them named me in their video, so I feel an obligation at this point. Now, early on, I didn't have a lot of places to look or resources, resources to look for information. So, my primary teacher has always been Mother Nature. Now, Mother Nature has been doing this bigger, longer, and more successful than any of us could ever imagine. So to say that we can't take those same natural systems that we've been studying for thousands of years and apply that science and those systems indoors in a controlled environment, to me it just sounds kind of silly. So I'm going to share with you guys my perspective and my opinion on this from a martial arts standpoint, more specifically using jujitsu. Sounds silly, but hear me out. Now, in jujitsu, your opponent's strengths can be used against them. And that's kind of the concept. He pushes, I pull. He pulls, I push. Uh, you, know, you don't know, you, you go with the flow versus trying to fight things head on. You anticipate your opponent's moves. I grab his arm, he pulls his arm. I go left, he goes right. When you start to anticipate, you know the probability of what your opponent's going to do. You can make better decisions on how to trick your opponent, how to trap your opponent, how to, how to do all these different things. Now let's apply that to a living system, more specifically, our living mulch. Now when we first started off, we were super clover heavy. That's what everybody was doing. That's what we were doing. After time, a little bit of time, we started noticing that, yeah, clover is definitely more problematic than the solutions it provides. There's a lot easier ways to get nitrogen into the system than putting a nitrogen fixing plant in your soil that attracts and harbors pests. So we culled all the clover and we ran brown mulch for a while, straw and wood chips. Didn't have much, much cover crop going down in our soil. And we actually had bigger problems. We actually had more threat pressure. Uh, the spider mites that were in our clovers were now crawling up our plants. Uh, things of that nature. So then I started studying these plants, their strengths and their weaknesses, and how I can use that to my advantage. So I'll use a couple case in points would be the first time I encountered green aphids. Not a big deal, but we'll get there. So when I first encountered green aphids, it was in a large facility, commercial facility. And one of the things that I noticed right away just by scouting my rooms and just doing my due diligence was the green aphids preferred the clover over the cannabis. And I had clover all over my beds. So they were going from the clover to the cannabis, from the cannabis to the clover, and just this big buffet aphid buffet going on so what i did was i culled all the clover from all my all my beds all my soils and then i planted the clover in a small pot and i placed several small plot pots to be precise and i placed that pot in the corner of a room and i drew all the aphids in that room to that pot and then i busted out my trusty old blowtorch and I sent them to hell. It's the most organic way you can deal with things, in my opinion, is fire. A little risky at times. I, I get it. So that's just one case where I took something that presented a problem. I flipped the script and I made that problem a solution. 
So that brings me to my next point is that everything can serve a purpose if you know its strengths and weaknesses and how to apply them. So just let's take for example, this country for, for, for example. We have a diverse population of people from, from multiple countries all over the world speaking multiple languages, so much good food, so much good music, so much good parties. It's a polyculture. America is, is a polyculture of people. We have, we have multiple cultures that coexist and it's an awesome place. Now, can you imagine if we were the monoculture of the United States and all we had were rich white dudes? That would not be a fun place to live, I'm sorry. Same concept goes with this soil and our plants. Our plants don't wanna live in, a, in beds surrounded by clones of themselves. There's no biological intelligence shared in that system. So it doesn't make sense to try to, to treat it like that. I, I, I don't see the value in that. So going on to my aphids thing, green aphids were my first experience using trap plants. From there, I learned about banker plants and having pollinators in the system that can feed my predators more in between pest outbreaks, keep them around longer, spend less money on pests, and been successful at it. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the plants we use and why. Because I get this question a lot. So the primary plant that we use that everybody always sees, I'll try to get it in here, that's dichondra. So that's basically the use, what we use that for is just simply to cover the soil. It, it's a ground cover. It's easy to manage. It, it, it doesn't need reseeding. Um, it grows good in low light, but also will die off in low light. And it's just an easy to manage plant indoors. So we use it to cover the soil, to keep it from eroding when we water um, and all that good stuff. Also, we use chickweed, another really good ground cover. Um, it has a really good um, consistency to it as far as it's fluffy. It adds a really good aeration to the mulch layer. It, it, it's not, it doesn't uh, get super heavy and layered. Um, it, it stays fluffy like a sponge and it, it's, it's, it's a really good environment. Um, now, both of these two cover crops are, are really unfavored to most pests. Not to say that pests won't linger on them. That would be untrue. But it's not what they want to eat. It's, it's not what they look forward to eating. So it, I don't have to worry about an abundance of problems growing down there. And then we also use from time to time, you'll see grasses. Something to take into consideration when you're choosing your cover crops, your companion plants, your whatever, it, is their roots. See, our dichondra has super shallow roots and creates a, a thick carpet across the top of the soil where it's not really pumping sugar, it's pumping exudates deep. So it's not really expanding the biology in the soil to the depth that it could go. So that's why the grass is good. It's gonna have much deeper roots than the dichondra, than the chickweed. So it, it's good to take into consideration just how you're occupying that soil with what. We also then use various companion plants like marigolds and brassicas and things like that that produce biotoxins that may kill an unwanted pest or pathogen. Don't want to go too far down that road, it's a long one with a lot of big words I can't pronounce. Anyways, so with a combination of companion plants, ground cover, both brown mulch and green mulch, uh, we have found success. Now, it's not to say that we haven't had problems. It's just that we always pay attention and learn from them. We evolve. We're not just going to give up the first time we see something that we don't like. We're going to find out how to defeat it. We're going to rise to the occasion. So that's my perspective on some of the values of cover crops is at the end of the day, you're going to get pests. You're going to. They're going to show up eventually. And if you don't have something else for them to eat, they're going to be on your cannabis plant. And the beauty about having a living mulch is I can find things that they like more than my cannabis plant. Like I explained about the aphids. And then I can take the fight there. So deep in the flower or in the flower in general, I can't spray nothing. 
not that I would spray anything bad, but even compost teas and organic sprays, I can't even use because I'll fail the microbial side of the test. So by having companion plants and by having a living mulch, what that allows me to do is it allows me to find plants that my pests like more than my cannabis. It allows me to take the fight somewhere other than my cash crop. So I'll plant, whether it's clover in a pot and I bust out the torch, or it's dichondra, chickweed, marigolds, whatever it is in my beds that I can spray with a compost tea when I can't spray my flowers. Either way, it takes the fight where I want to take it and it puts me in control. So those same problems that people have found, again, I have found ways to make those solutions. And you have to be persistent, you have to mean it, you have to have good intentions. This isn't fakeable. I mean, it is on Instagram, I'll be honest, but in, in real life, when you're walking people through this facility, they see it, they feel it, they can breathe it, they can smell it. The energy is in the air. Uh, the product speaks for itself. I run these rooms, again, with two people, two women, so it, it can be done. It's just, are you willing to put in the work? Are you willing to put the science to the test? Are you willing to have faith in Mother Nature?